Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. George H. Smith was formerly senior research fellow for the Institute for Humane Studies, a lecturer on American history for Cato Summer Seminars, and executive editor of Knowledge Products. Smith's fourth book, The System of Liberty, was recently published by Cambridge University Press. He is also a contributor to Libertarianism.org. He writes our Excursions column, a weekly essay in libertarian intellectual history, which has reached, I think, is it number 167 this week as we yeah, record? Yeah, it's around there. It's hitting, getting close to 170. And Excursions is also available as a podcast. George is also the co-editor of Individualism, a reader, the first in a series of readers published by Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. George, you've been active in libertarian circles for quite some time and have become one of the, the great experts we have on the history of classical liberalism. So how did you get started in all this? Well, I first got interested in ideas, generally speaking, when I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, that would be around 1964, I guess. And I first started reading free thought literature. Uh, one of the first books I read was Thomas Paine's Age of Reason. Uh, I also read Robert Ingersoll. Now, that literature, although not hardcore libertarian all the time, is largely classical liberal. You find these passionate defenses of religious freedom, which ever since then I believe has been the core issue in the history of libertarian uh, thought. And uh, a couple, about two and a half years later, when I was a junior in high school, I happened to catch Ayn Rand on Johnny Carson's uh, Tonight Show. And I'd never heard of her. I'd never read anything by her, but I was immediately taken with her. I just liked her upfront attitude. I know that a lot of people think she was over the top, but she was a tough lady. And you had to be tough back then to be a woman writer, uh, free market in an age in the 50s when you know, the Soviet Union was all the rage. So I admired her immediately, and I admired her, admired her uh, because she was so candid and unapologetic. And I think a couple months after that, I was in a local bookstore in Tucson with a friend and happened to run across The Virtue of Selfishness. And I thought, oh, that sounds like a book I'd like. So I purchased it and read it, and it, it got me interested in philosophy in general and certainly in Rand's ideas. And from then, you know, it's the old too chilly thing. It usually begins with Ayn Rand. <laughs> I never had that sort of how should I describe it? Orthodox attitude. I did start a Students of Objectivism club at the University of Arizona, but it was more like a philosophy discussion club. Probably because of my background in free thought, I had no patience for that true believer mentality, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. A lot more of those types were around back then than probably are around today. And um, so it was kind of a philosophy discussion group, but I read more widely than just Rand. I read Rothbard, Mises, Hayek, and established on the university one of the first. Uh, SIL, S-I-L chapters, on any campus, so far as I know. That and what does S-I-L stand for? Uh, Society for Individual Liberty. It was a precursor to ISIL, uh, not the terrorist <laughs> Islamic <laughs> group ISIL, but International Society for Individual Liberty. And uh, Jarrett Wolstein and Roy Childs were the two uh, people behind that. That got me into correspondence with Roy. Later I met him and, and so on and so on. And then you eventually uh – you professionalized it in some, I mean, in some way. Was Institute for Humane Studies your first uh, professional association? or? Yeah. Uh, well, either that or Cato. I don't recall which. Uh, my problem was lack of academic cred credentials. I mean, I'm gloriously uncredentialed. I don't even have a high school diploma. And launching a, basically an I think that's wonderful, career so. without so much as a high school diploma is not something that most people would advise I, one to I, do. I wonder how many people without a high school diploma have published a book with Cambridge University Press. <laughs> yeah, that would be a really good trivia question. I agree. Well, when David Bowes uh, of Cato, of course, uh, first informed me that Cambridge had uh, agreed to publish it, you could have pretty much knocked me over with a straw. I never imagined they would. I thought without credentials, uh, you know, I, I, I did talk myself, I should say, in, in the interest of honesty, I did talk myself in the University of Arizona without a high school diploma. Uh, that was an interesting story in its own right, but because my grades were so good, I just quit high school because it was very boring. And I stayed in high, uh, but I only lasted three years at the university. I just took all the courses, I, I crammed all the courses I wanted to take, philosophy and history. Then I was stuck with the un, unappetizing prospect of another year and a half of nothing but those required courses you're supposed to take early on. Back then, the computer systems they didn't really exist, so you could get away with stuff like signing up for. When, when a heavy load was 18 credits, I'd mm -hmm. sign up for 22 or 24, cram in everything I wanted to take, then drop the required stuff. Mm 
so I could only take courses. I would only take courses that interested me. And once they no longer interested me, I thought, well, maybe it's time to head out to the big city, in this case, Los Angeles. And I don't know what I thought I was going to do out there. Maybe open up a philosophy shop or something. But. Now, at some point around this time, you did you did write Atheism, A Case Against God fairly early. At the, right? Yes, I was 22 when I started it and 24 when it finished. It took about a year and a half. That was a, a funny story. I, I, I don't want to get into a lot of anecdotes. But basically, I had met Roy. You know, after a year of working in a warehouse in the L.A. area, I thought, well, maybe finishing college isn't such a bad idea. So I gave notice, packed up my books. And meantime, Roy Child shows up in L.A., and uh, he and I became very good friends, and we knew of each other from our correspondence. But he, he came just around the, about a couple of weeks when I was getting ready to leave, go back to Tucson, and he didn't want to lose his friend in conversation. So he kept asking me, well, what can I get you to stay in Los Angeles, to do to stay in Los Angeles? And I said, well, Roy, you know, I, I'm ready to go. I quit my job. There's nothing, really. So one day he says, well, how about if I got you a contract to write a book on atheism? He knew of my interest in the subject. And my attitude, and you have to understand, this is within a week of when I'm scheduled to leave. I go, sure, Roy, I've got no credentials, nothing. And you've got five days to get me a contract? Sure, get me a contract to write a book, and I'll stay in this area. Well, sure enough, he did that. He did it through the fact that <laughs> a little chicanery. But he had previously talked to Ed Nash at Nash Publishing and knew he wanted someone to write a book on that topic. So he kind of lassoed me into it. But literally within a week, uh, Roy and I were in the offices of Nash Publishing on Sunset. They were in the same building that Daniel Brandon had his offices. And I signed a contract. Wow. So if, if, if ever a book fell into someone's lap, you know, that was it. And then you um, – I mean this, this has all been leading up to the, the pinnacle of your career, which is becoming a columnist for libertarianism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's called the Whig view of history. <laughs> exactly. It's happened in the past. leads up to the glorious achievements of freedom in the present. I have to say, though, that this uh, experience with uh, you guys, uh, with L.org, has really been good for me because I've, I thought I was going to die with all of this arcane knowledge that I had been uh, you know, accumulating, sort of like a hamster putting stuff in his cheeks. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, what good is this going to do anyone? Because I really, I, you know, I probably have averaged several hours of reading a day for 45 years and practically lived in research libraries like at UCLA. And, I, you know, you read a lot of stuff, and I was very interested in it. And I thought, well, but this is, you know, I'm never going to be able to write about all this stuff. Well, L dot, the L.org excursion series has given me a chance to, you know, get a lot of that out. And I actually very much appreciate that because it's, I, don't, I don't feel all that time was wasted now that I spent uh, studying. Well, then let's, let's turn to the book. Um, Which is a product of that, of that hamster cheek uh, <laughs> yes. accumulation of knowledge or partially. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so we, we yes. you and I talked quite a while ago about putting together this this series of readers and ended up picking ended up picking individualism as the first one. So it's why why individualism to kick off this series? Uh, well, first of all, I want to say that uh, this series was your idea. It's not like Marilyn Moore, my co-editor, uh, and I came to you. So you deserve people should know that this was your baby. And you came to us or came to me, and then I, I wanted Marilyn as a co-editor. Um, so you deserve credit for that. But I don't know. You asked me to draw up a list of possible books, as I recall, and uh, I thought there was a lot of stuff on individualism that really needed to get out there because, um, as I explained in the introduction to the book, there's just these terrible misrepresentations of individualism. I start off the introduction by, there's a reason, uh, by commenting on a recent book by what's his name, Claro or something. He's a professor of sociology somewhere. The myth of the individual or something Right, like and he yeah. starts off uh, talking about extreme individualism being represented by the Unabomber, uh, Kaczynski. And I just, you know, it's one of those things, you ever pick up a book and just want to tear it up immediately <laughs> upon reading the first page? I just thought, you know, this is really gutsy in a bad way. I mean, this is just outrageous. Introducing students, and it's intended as an introduction to sociology, that this is how bad individualism is. Because if you're an individualist, you'll end up being a unabomber, in effect. So anyway, I just thought there was a lot of important stuff. So we came to the agreement that individualism should be the first reader. Because there is a lot of material in there that even longtime libertarians have never read. So, what? Uh, in addition to the, I, I have gotten the the Unabomber comparison too, but in addition to that, uh, really bad, really bad uh, 
description of individuals and what are some of the more pernicious ones? In in the introduction you write, uh, individualism originated as a term of opprobrium and it has retained its negative connotations to this day among both conservative and socialist intellectuals. In, in what way do they kind of describe individualism? Well, the interesting thing, which I also discussed in the introduction, is that the most common uh, criticism, and what makes this interesting, is it's voiced by both people on the right, such as Edmund Burke, and by people on the left, most notably Karl Marx. This is something in, uh, conservatives and socialists have in common. Both attack individualism for what they call social atomism, and it varies. The, the stereotype varies, but basically it means that uh, individualism uh, views people, sociologically speaking, as isolated atoms, sort of on their own Robinson Crusoe items owing nothing to society. They don't realize that they couldn't have done anything without society. The language alone requires social cooperation. In other words, to make, make this as brief as I can, the, the stereotypical idea of individualism is somehow thinks that the individual is self-sufficient. And it's a, it's a parody, really. Because as you guys know, you're both very well read in this literature, the leading so-called individualists, such as Adam Smith, being the most notable example, sociability. And the importance of social relationships is paramount in all of these people. It's, it's not just mentioned. It's a major theme. Herbert Spencer is another example. Now, if, any, if ever there was an extreme individualist, certainly Spencer was one. You know, he's a founding father of sociology, for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. And many of his volumes deal with social relationships and the importance of social relationships. The difference, of course, is that these individualists believe primarily in voluntary social relationships, not in the coercive social relationships imposed by a government. That's the difference. It's not that uh, this Robinson Crusoe idea that somehow, uh, you know, we're self-sufficient. Uh, economics grew uh, as a discipline, with the rec and, and primarily by individualistic thinkers like Smith and Ricardo and these people, economics itself is built on the idea of the importance of voluntary social cooperation. So this is just one of those a ridiculous myths. There are some others as well. Uh, some are the kind of typical individualists, and sometimes Ayn Rand will be cited here, uh, are selfish. They don't care about other people. Whereas, of course, we all know that leftists and progressives, they really care about people. That, it seems to be the primary uh, claim to fame. They really care. Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, it's in, I was just looking at it shortly before um, this interview. There's a brief excerpt in The Individualism Reader by Oscar Wilde from The Soul of Man Under Socialism. And I should note that socialism didn't mean in the 19th century what it necessarily means today. Was it more of a Shavian type of thing? Sorry? More of a Shavian type of thing? Uh, well, it, could mean, it just meant voluntary social cooperation. Uh, you find a lot of uh, pre-thinkers in the 19th century talking about socialism, but they were talking about Robert Owens, uh, of cooperation, cooperative societies. These were not coercive societies. Benjamin Tucker, as you probably know, the great American uh, anarchist, uh, called himself a socialist. But he also explicitly wrote against what he called state socialism. Socialism back then, it didn't always mean this, but it often meant... The, the, the benefits of, of social cooperation, so as opposed to state coercion. So, you know, meanings change this way. But uh, anyway, Oscar Wilde made the, I think, fascinating point, and it's in that, it's a fairly short excerpt. He says, you know, it's not, talking about selfishness, uh, individualists being accused of being selfish. He said, you know, it's not selfish to want to live your own life according to your own judgment and pursue happiness in your own way. What is truly selfish is to insist that other people should live their lives as you think they should to be happy. It's really a very interesting insight. He said, you know, selfishness demands uniformity. It demands that everything conform to itself. And the least selfish people are those people who just think people should be left alone to live their own lives. That's the ultimate tribute you can pay to other people. You know, if you want my advice, if you want my help, that's fine. But otherwise, you're free to do what you like. Yeah, there's a quote in the Wild uh, essay, which I starred a bunch. Uh, a red rose is not selfish because it wants to be a red rose. Exactly. It would be horribly selfish if it wanted all the flowers in the garden to be both red and roses. Right. And that, you know, I've read a lot of this literature, and I've, I've read at some point uh, Wild's uh, Soul of Man Under Socialism. But when Marilyn and I were going out to pick out the best excerpts, you know, sometimes when you pay that much attention, lines, individual lines will strike you and say, boy, that's really good. And uh, I've always, uh, when I was, uh, you know, preparing this anthology, that, in fact, Marilyn pointed out to me, she says, you know, isn't this a good insight by Wilde? And it is. And it's one of those nice, uh, very well, of course, he was a great writer and that, that doesn't hurt, but it's a wonderful point. I want to ask about, I, I 
seem to ask this in every episode of Free Thought, something about, about motives. Um, when people are criticizing individualism or when they're – I mean specifically when they're misrepresenting it as you've been describing, is this misrepresentation coming from a, a desire to undercut this idea that may be incompatible with their pre preferred social organizing principles or preferred you know, scope of government power? So it's you know, individualism is something that's threatening to their preferred worldview so we need to make it out to look really bad or is it more that these notions of individualism, the, the kinds that the individualists are articulating are so alien to the way that these people, Burke and Marx and other critics think that, that it's just – it's almost like they can't quite understand it, like they're making an effort to understand it but doing a very poor job of it. Well, I think it's probably a combination of both. Uh, one way I've disagreed with a lot of my academic colleagues who are libertarians over the years, in fact, I've gotten into some arguments about this. I don't necessarily, I think generally you should presume the honesty of the motives of your adversaries, but I've run across too many, shall I call them lefties in my life, in person and in print, that I just think they have malicious motives. I don't think really some of these people care that much how much they misrepresent individualism. I think they're just convinced that they know the way. Uh, this is a sort of, uh, uh, you know, anybody who stands in my way is an enemy. And they certainly don't bother to read, most of them, I should say. There's always, ex please understand, I understand there are exceptions to this. There are intelligent lefties, there are well meaning lefties. But I'm talking sort of about run of the mill types. Uh, uh, Claro might be an example. I don't want to pick on him in particular, but the, the misrepresentations of individualism by the left are so egregious sometimes. Spencer, of course, I've written about this on the excursions uh, on the all.org site. Uh, my, my conclusion there is that they just don't bother to read them. You get this textbook myth generated. Uh, I mean, what, let me give you an example. I often recommended this to students years ago when I was uh, teaching for uh, uh, in Soup for Maine Studies in Cato. I said, okay, suppose you want to assess a history of political thought book or you got one for your college class and you need to read it. Go to the index, look under Spencer. Now, usually these books will have something on Spencer. He was just too big of a figure for them to ignore entirely. Sometimes it will be very short, a few paragraphs compared to, say, J.S. Mill, virtually an entire chapter, even though in many respects Spencer was far more important than Mill was, far more widely read in his time. But I said, look under Spencer, then go to the text. And if, the, and if in a few paragraphs, one of the dominant things you read is, Spencer was a social Darwinist, blah, blah, blah. I said, then you can be sure that this is not a reliable text. Because what's happening here, not that the writer is deliberately distorting Spencer's ideas, but he hasn't read Spencer. What he has read instead are the standard secondary accounts, and he's merely regurgitating what somebody else was probably regurgitating, going back to a number of writers back even to the late uh, 19th century. Now, fortunately, that has changed, especially with Spencer. There have been some recent studies, I, some by libertarian types, that uh, Roderick Long has written some important things. There's other writers who are coming out with Spencer stuff that's starting to correct that distorted picture. But it's an important issue, Aaron, because... You know, when you're in college and if you're excited about ideas and you're thinking, well, who, who would be interesting to read in more detail? And you hear that someone named Herbert Spencer advocated this loathsome policy of let the poor die off. Uh, who cares? Which is just totally ridiculous uh, so far as attributing that to Spencer. You're not going to be interested in pursuing that uh, uh, writer or a philosopher later in life. You're going to think, oh, I'm not going to bother to read that jerk. And that's that's a very... Uh, real and unfortunately uh, harmful effect of this sort of uh, uh, what I call textbook stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are other writers, by the way, but Spencer is probably the best example. I had that exact experience with Spencer. I don't think I've ever had a bigger dichotomy between what I was told he was saying and then what I actually read from him. It was absolutely shocking to me. It's, it's amazing. It's like 180 degrees in some cases. Yeah. It's, it's just amazing. So the book is divided into six sections, which is which you, you state in the introduction is, is imperfect. But but I, I thought yeah. it would be interesting the, the way we get into that. Uh, first one is individuality, then social individualism, moral individualism, political individualism, religious individualism, and then economic individualism. How did you kind of think about those sections, generally speaking, as imperfect as they are? Well, some I think I also mentioned. Some are pretty obvious. I think it's pretty easy to spot economic individualism. Uh, 
some of the other categories are difficult. Moral individualism, um, you know, covers a wide range of topics. So some, to be honest with you, some of it was just sort of arbitrary. You know, we were long on one section and short on another. And I said, well, we could stick this one over there. That, that wasn't the rule, but it, it did happen occasionally. Um, but, you know, there, the thing about, I like about the libertarian tradition and have always liked is its interconnectedness, its interdisciplinary nature. So all of these things hook up at some point. And if I could digress just for a second, since I know Adam Smith is often discussed on your podcast, there's a wonderful kind of passing suggestion, and I know for the life of me, I can't remember exactly where it is. It's probably in the theory of moral sentiments, where Smith is talking about why people are attracted to a, a theoretical system to begin with. And I think he talks specifically about the system of natural liberty. And he, he suggested that a lot of people, and I assume here he probably meant younger people, are initially attracted to it because of its uh, excuse me because of its aesthetic qualities, because of the way it hangs together, because of how one part you know connects to the next, almost like a nicely made watch, uh, and that gets them interested. It's that kind of excitement, like wow, this this is great, and over here you got this, and it all ties together. Well, I think that is true about libertarianism, and I think it's uh, what attracted me to it, and I think that's what you'll find uh, in this anthology. That although there is no grand sweeping overview showing how this all this fits together. Uh, I think you'll, it's quite obvious to readers how one one part links up to another. So, to go back to your original question, to some extent, the the divisions are arbitrary. The most difficult is the idea of individuality as opposed to individualism. I discuss that uh, in my introduction when I get into Jacob Burkhart, who talks about the rise of individualism in the Renaissance. And when he ta- or individuality, and when he talks about individuality, he kind of means a sense that the unique qualities of the person are worth expressing. It doesn't necessarily entail political individualism or economic individualism. In fact, since Burkhart attributed the rise of individuality to the petty uh, despotic states, uh, petty despots in Renaissance Italy, uh, it, it actually contradicts that. But you do have this, according to Burkhardt, some historians that argues it goes back earlier, you have this conception of individuals as unique and worthwhile in themselves, not as parts of a group, uh, not as what your status is, what your ranking is in the social order, but your unique characteristics are, are valued for their own sake. And that's more or less what has been meant by individuality. Well, in the Mill essay in particular, which I think I first remember reading uh, – is some sort of excerpt when I was a, a teenager, and it seemed to me like a very big uh, rumination on how important it is to be a nonconformist, which I really liked when I was a teenager. But there's a line right. where he says, "No one's idea of excellence in conduct is that people should do absolutely nothing but copy one another," which is a, a great line. And that, that Mill one is really about uh, developing right. the, the self, correct? Uh, yeah, and the thing of Mill, and you'll, we also include the uh, chapter from von Humboldt, uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt. You'll, and, and Mill quoted him, and you'll see the similarity between the two ideas, <clears throat> because what both philosophers stressed was it's not just enough to have freedom of action to develop individuality. You also have to have a variety of circumstances. And what that does, it links the political, namely freedom, to the cultural. So the idea would be, suppose if you had freedom in a very rigidly orthodox society, a, say a deeply religious society where if you're not punished in the sense that you're not put in jail or fined, but if you go out of the orthodox way at all, you'll be shunned. So it's – now, you, could, you know, I would argue, well, you know, that's the way it is. I mean, you, you know, some communities might be like that. If that's what people want to live in, that's their business. But both philosophers, Mill and Humboldt, argued that if you really want to develop individuality, you need a cultural variety of circumstances. You need what today would be called a pluralistic society. And that's what they were defending uh, on the social side, on the cultural side, not just political freedom, but an, an arena that is diverse enough that each person can exercise his or her own, her own unique talents in that society. And then that led to the idea of increasing individuality. That is to say, once you become good as an actor or a singer or a writer or whatever, uh, you then become highly specialized. And then you can interact with other people and you'll both benefit. All those people will benefit from the skills and insights of other people. It's really a division of labor argument applied to um, uh, individual characteristics. It sounds like Haight Ashbury in about 1968. Everyone can let their freak flag fly and, and hang out together and trade ideas, right? Yeah, uh, I, but I think probably it requires fairly intelligent people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except for that other part too. Yes, I agree. I'm not sure. I don't. 
want to knock Kate Ashbury, but you know, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, but the idea there being yes. Well, isn't this uh, it, isn't this where like the the say progressive or the Marxist or someone might jump in the the non free market folks and say, look, that's a great story and it's. It's wonderful if you know you've got the resources to pursue your passions and live as this autonomous being developing, you know, into a, a special snowflake of your own. But especially under you know this this regime of freedom that that you, George Smith, advocate, um, lots of people are going to be destitute and dirt poor and won't won't have this opportunity. So you've basically you know you've. You've given a nice philosophy for the lives of the independently wealthy, but what about the rest of us? Well, that I guess presupposes the economic argument that a free market will result in vast numbers of dirt poor people, and obviously we don't agree with that. Uh, you have dirt poor people under governments. I mean, to a certain extent, I think you're always going to have poor people for whatever reason. There's no magic cure to that. I mean, I think Mises once said that poverty is really the natural condition of humankind. The remarkable thing, the thing we need to explain is not why some people remain poor but why so many are, not, are no longer poor. Uh, that's the progress. I think I, – I'm not a utopian. I don't think that a free society will ever reach the point where you won't have – certainly you'll have people that have misfortune. Uh, but I don't think you're going to have people that uh, – masses of people that are desperately poor for economic reasons. Uh, so that's the premise of that argument. But let's suppose it was true. Uh, what's wrong with voluntary charity? You know, whenever I, people ask me about that, um, I remember I was arguing, it wasn't that long ago, it was a free thought meeting I went to, and some global warming fanatic, and I, I'm sort of neutral on that. I, my skepticism is about the computer models that project all of these catastrophic consequences, but let's leave that aside. And, but as soon as he found out I wasn't completely horrified by the prospect of global warming, he started, you know, well, don't you think da da da? I said, well, now you seem to think this is going to lead to catastrophic consequences, like what, in 20 years, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I said, well, then, gee, you must what, donate, what, 90% of your income to this, to this cause because if it's going to wipe out the human race, then surely. Well, it turns out, of course, he doesn't really donate. Well, I pay my taxes. Well, that's, that's the kind of the hypocrisy in this. Anybody who has that, oh, what about the poor? I, I would wager that conservatives and libertarians probably do more, uh, show more concern for the poor uh, than many lefties I do. think that's actually but, been demonstrated in terms of charitable giving in a, in a couple studies that conservatives and libertarians give more than people on the left. Right. Which is interesting, could be interestingly tied to individualism in and of itself because um, – Part of the interesting question of individualism might be how you extrapolate from the way you view yourself and what you think about your own life and your own inner desires and goals to what you think the rest of society might be like, for example. And if you think about people like Adam Smith and people like Herbert Spencer who did so much championing of individual beneficence and individual charity right. and then you wonder whether or not those who think that individual charity as on individual – on that basis is adequate or inadequate for helping out the poor, maybe they're just extrapolating that they don't feel very charitable themselves to the, a, a broader view of society. Right. I agree with that. And uh, I, you know, I have a hard time understanding the mentality of the do as I do types. Uh, I've never understood that. Ever since I was a kid, I used to wonder, wh why is it so important that other people snap into line with what you think they should do? Um, I've met many libertarians like that. Uh, I have this sort of insufficient theory. I was going to say another word, but uh, <laughs> insufficient theory of um, – of the libertarian, do you know, do you know who the, that uh, libertarian historian was? He died some time ago, James Martin, James J. Martin. Mm -hmm. He had a theory that libertarians are born and not made. And uh, the idea was that certain people are, I don't agree with this, by the way, but it may be true to a certain extent, that certain people are just born with this kind of libertarian sentiment. And most libertarians I talked to certainly can identify with that in their early lives. They didn't like to be told what to do without a reason. I was like, like that with my parents, and they caught on very early. If, if my mother said, do this, and I say, why? She said, because I'm your mother, that's why. I said, just give me a reason. She'd give me a reason, and I'd go, oh, okay. And I suspect a lot of libertarians will identify with that. I don't know what the, er what the early training or upbringing is of statist or control types, but it's a very different way of looking at the world. Uh, it's this sort of sometimes characterized as sort of utopian view, or, or it, it's, it's what Rand would call altruism. I know what's best for you. Um, I've studied this problem, and I know what's best for you. So when I use force against you, 
when I pass a law to force you to do something, it's really for your own good. Now, I find that deeply offensive on a personal level. It's like what Adam Smith said about the apprenticeship laws. He, he called them impertinent, that, that government's going to come in and tell the employer and the employed, we know what's best for you, is that these people can't make that decision for themselves. And he used the word impertinent, which I've always remembered, because that's something I think libertarians sometimes miss. They talk about the economic efficiency. They may even talk about natural rights. But the sheer impertinence of some government bureaucrat coming up to somebody and saying, well, I've made this decision. Now You have to buy this insurance and you have to do this. You can't do that. But rest assured, it's all for your own good. That just, if anything, uh, just makes me angry uh, on a deep level. That's it. Like, where do you get this presumption that you know anything of the sort? And if you really are convinced that you know it, then why not try to convince the person? You know, it's like, so have you ever tried trying to persuade somebody to do something instead of pointing a gun at their head? Exactly. And that would be going, the, the individualism element of seeing yourself as, as a person who designs and, and creates and lives your own life, which has, I think, led many people in the classical liberal tradition to be ahead of the curve in thinking about the individual. A, for example, in one of the essays you include in the book by Mary Wollstonecraft on right. on feminist on female right, women's rights for for I think that exact same reason. Yeah, she she criticized this sort of a condescending attitude that men had towards women. Uh, Wollstonecraft was an interesting writer. I personally find her letters actually more interesting in many ways than her published work. She tend to write wrote she wrote very quickly. And um, but it's a fascinating story her whole relationship with William Godwin and you know all that. But, well, yeah, you know, that's the other thing. Some of these characters, and it's, I always like to try to understand something about the writer. During the nearly seven years that I wrote, I was an executive editor for Knowledge Products, which produced these audio tapes, a combination of narration with actors reading the voices of the original characters. Very well done. In fact, uh, Cato, the Cato University has uh, remastered, and they didn't remaster them, but they put a new introduction on them, and uh, a number of them. And one thing I did when I wrote most of the, uh, of the original series on great political thinkers, and one thing I did was try to understand the mindset of the person I was trying to explain. Because a number of the people I wrote about, I didn't like. They're like Thomas Hobbes. I wrote a two-tape set, roughly 90 manuscript pages. And I, I resolved that I would read over and over again Leviathan. I'd always buy three copies of a book and then I'd go through one, mark it up, and I'd go through a clean copy to erase any preconceptions, things like that. <laughs> I, I had these things I went through because I did want to represent honestly these, the point of view. I just didn't want to do a hatchet job on these guys. And I, I swear to God, I almost got to the point or really did get to the point where I could sort of think like Hobbes was thinking. I'd say, okay, now my next step in this argument would be, if I were Hobbes, and sure enough, that would be his next step. So it's that kind of internal way of thinking. Now, with great thinkers, you can do that usually because they're concerned with consistency. With more mediocre thinkers and really low-level thinkers like politicians, <laughs> uh, you don't – it's it's just – uh, deuces wild. I mean, who knows? But what Wollstonecraft's know? letters kind of you said so that show that maybe about her? Well, she led a very tumultuous life um, and a very interesting life. I mean, she was over in France during the early stages of the French Revolution. She wrote these very dramatic letters home because she was very pro French Revolution, as were the other English libertarians at the time. And uh, she was involved with that circle of people William Godwin, Thomas Paine. Uh, the sort of radical Whigs that met uh, uh, fairly regularly at, 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 I forget the publisher's name, he published a lot of libertarian literature, but they, they met in the upstairs, uh, had these meetings. Uh, William Blake was a member of that group, and he wrote that famous poem, Mary, which was about Mary Wollstonecraft. But there was this interesting group of people who met regularly. The same is true in France of the so-called salons. Uh, taverns were a very popular meeting place. Uh, especially in Scotland. The Scots love to meet in taverns and drink until 4 or 5 in the morning, then they'd all go home. Um, and, uh, I think so it's anyway, the same today, remember, actually. Uh, I think, I'm sorry, go I ahead. think it's the same today. <laughs> <laughs> well, coffee houses yeah, exactly. are also yeah. very big. And, you know, by the way, uh, see, I'm, I'm starting to digress, and I swore I wouldn't do this. But one reason it can be misleading when you're reading somebody, think, well, who did he read or who did she read to get these ideas. Many times it was from conversations that aren't recorded because they spent much of their time in social groups and that those so social groups had a lot to do, in my judgment, with the spread of libertarian ideas, especially in the 17th and 18th centuries. You know, uh, was it King? Which King was it? King James? Uh, what year? Well, this is probably pre-revolution. It was probably King James the uh, First. 
uh, wrote uh, actually wrote a tract against coffee and coffee houses. Oh yes, it was James the first. Yeah. Yes. I, oh good. I I got my monarch right. <laughs> but that's interesting. It wasn't just because of the supposedly bad effects on health. It was also because this is where the seditious radicals and the free thinkers and the, you know the anarchists met. And so we got to watch these these uh, you know these uh, seditious meeting places. I one of these you talk about these stories and and then. Teeing off of the the Wollstonecraft stuff, this is similar. This is a story about women's rights to a large extent. I found the you have a selection in there from a trial transcript, right? Um, and Moses Harmon. Yeah, can you can you tell us about that? I thought that was a, a pretty interesting story. Yeah, Moses Harmon uh, was the editor out of um, oh, what was that small town in Kansas. Um, doesn't really matter. He lived in a small town in Kansas, published a periodical. I used to have some copies of it uh, called Lucifer the Light Bearer. And this was a radical free thought paper, but it also advocated free love. Now, free love didn't mean what many people might think it means today. It meant that the government shouldn't be involved in any type of sexual relationships. Um, Lucifer the Light Bearer, if I recall my details accurately, uh, was the first to use can I mention the four-letter word, yeah. fuck, in print. Um, he had an, what he called an open word policy, I meaning he wouldn't censor. The, the, only, the interesting thing about Harmon, he was kind of a Puritan himself. He, he lived a very conservative lifestyle, but he believed that if you're going to discuss issues, you've got to have this open word policy. Uh, he went to prison, oh, I don't know the exact number of times, uh, twice, maybe three times, the last time he was quite old, he was breaking hard rocks in the midwinter. One of his prosecutions, what was called the Markham letter. Markham was a physician, and he wrote a letter to Lucifer the Light Bearer, which they published, in which he complained that a, a, a patient of his, a woman, had recently given birth. Had, I don't know if it was a C-section or what it was, but had required stitches. And her husband had forced sex upon her and reopened the stitches, stitches and she had bled badly. And he argued that this should be considered rape. It didn't matter if they were married. This should be rape. This is a very modern perspective. And we're talking, what, 1870s? Well, for publishing that letter, just for publishing it, uh, uh, Harmon was prosecuted for publishing obscenity. He was the main target of the Comstock Act, um, uh, this Comstock character, really odd, bizarre, sadistic type character. Uh, this was, you know, against sending obs obscene material through the mails. I remember one incident uh, from my free thought history where some free thinker uh, wrote out on a postcard a passage, a particularly lascivious passage from the Old Testament, and there's a number of them, and announced that he would be sending this through the mail. And sure enough, uh, they arrested him, saying this was obscene material, <laughs> even though it was from the Old Testament. But anyway, uh, what happened was uh, the uh, daughter of, uh, of uh, Moses Harmon was Lillian Harmon. And she had um, fell in love with another anarchist freethinker. This was an anarchist periodical as well, named Edwin C. Walker. And they resolved to get married, but they didn't want any involvement of the church or the state. So they had a totally private, you know, free market ceremony. And uh, they got prosecuted. Both were thrown in jail. Uh, and I think the man, man, he served a longer time, uh, Walker, but it I was for a significant period of time. And uh, what, what, I, what Marilyn and I did in the, in the book was to publish a transcript of the wedding ceremony. And it's a wonderful ceremony. I mean, there's one point where Harmon says about his daughter, he says, I will not give her away because she is a self-owner and free to dispose of her own person. I mean, it's just wonder. I mean, I'm surprised somebody hasn't made like a movie or a miniseries out of this. It's, it's, a wonder, it, it's sort of a tragic story. People were hurt with these imprisonments, but it's just a, a fascinating story. And this, again, is a gripe of, I know, Sharon Presley and other uh, feminists uh, that are prominent in the libertarian movement, is this individualist strain in feminism has been largely ignored by what we might call mainstream feminists. And yet some of the, and many of these women were involved in abolitionism. They're better known. The Grimke sisters, for example. They were also individualists. Uh, but it, it's a shame. But it's almost like this sort of, well, if you are a, a, a kind of a radical individualist a feminist, then somehow you don't count. You're not as important. And yet you have people like uh, Lillian Harmon and E.C. Walker going to prison because they want to keep the government altogether out of, of uh, sexual and, and romantic relationships. Assuming that we're on the cusp of a, of a decision on the Supreme Court for gay marriage, that would have been a lot lot easier to get through if the government had never but been involved in marriage in the first right. place. I remember when I had a conversation. We were talking about the fact that we couldn't find any reference uh, 
the, while arguing that man, men and women should be able, free to marry on any terms they want, there was no mention of gay marriage. And I can only speculate it really wasn't much of an issue back then. I, I, I have to believe if it was an issue, they would have been, come out in favor of it. But I don't know the history of the controversy of gay marriage very much, but certainly, I mean, you know, my position as a libertarian is not so much that all gays should be able to marry or whatever. It's just get the government out of marriage. Make it a purely civil ceremony. Which is a pretty individualist concept, I would imagine. It is, yeah. And I think that's the ultimate solution to that. Because, you know, you have this slippery slope argument. I see Bill Riley, that guy, argue this all the time. Well, if you're going to let gays marry, then, excuse me, if you're going to let gays marry, then what if somebody uh, wants to marry, uh, you're going to have polygamous marriages. And what if somebody wants to marry an animal? <laughs> <laughs> this this question this tying together this um the the Lillian Hellman not Lillian Harman, Hellman Harman, Harman, Harman yes uh, <laughs> Lillian, Lillian Harman story uh with the the current Supreme Court decision we're waiting on raises something I was thinking like the these essays in this book are for the most part quite old yes um and and so these these issues how relevant is the stuff in this book today? Um, as series editor, I'm just going to say it's very relevant and people should buy copies. <laughs> but, right. but I mean, there's there's obviously historical interest in this stuff. You know, it's 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 of interest to people who are into the history of ideas. But do these essays still speak to us today? Still speak to live issues? Well, I, that's an important question. I'm, I'm glad you asked it. I think so, and I think anything. Any good philosophy spans time. Uh, I mean, it may be context-bound in the sense that it applies to an issue that's no longer relevant, but the principles don't apply. And I would say the same is true of good psychology. Uh, many great philosophers, and I don't particularly care much for their actual philosophical positions, I think had very good psychological insights. Um, but the, the point is, I think, I can't think of an exception to this. I mean, you can deal with the abolitionist movement might be an example. You might think, well, slavery is no longer an issue. But the point is the arguments that were used against slavery certainly are. And um, I mean, to, to expand on that just a second, just, you know, I, I can't help but to read this stuff and think of my own experiences in the libertarian movement. When I when I see these sort of factional disputes that occur, I go, yeah, I've had arguments like that, even though the one that's being written about was 150 years ago. And um, the in the abolitionist movement, you have these inter-movement debates about how to go about ending slavery. And you have three major schools. You have the political abolitionists, uh, mainly centered in New York. Uh, you have the, um, the moral suasion abolitionists, that would be William Lloyd Garrison and Wendell Phillips mainly, who didn't believe in political action. Um, in other words, they thought they're our primary argument, and these people took oaths very ser seriously. At that time, the Constitution was a pro-slavery document, and they said no conscientious abolitionist can possibly swear allegiance to a pro-slavery document. Um, and that's why Garrison said the U.S. Constitution is a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. So these people absolutely repudiated political action, and they argued moral suasion instead. And then you have the third group, which is a smaller group, represented by Lysander Spooner. And he actually advocated slave revolts. Uh, he wrote a broadside that apparently influenced John Brown and used it as sort of a model for the raid, famous raid, the aborted raid on Harper's Ferry. The idea was to um, go down, gather arms, and hence the armory, Harper's Ferry was an armory, and uh, hopefully slaves would escape and come coalesce around you. You would arm them. Then they would do kind of Spartacus sort of raids on slave plantations and then run off in the hills and build their army, you know, uh, a guerrilla army. Uh, well, that didn't go anywhere. In fact, the the Lysander Spooner types, did you guys know that Spooner actually, after Brown was captured and sentenced to be hanged, that he actually uh, hatched a plan to kidnap the governor of Virginia, take him out in a boat and hold him ransom for the exchange of John Brown? Oh, really? <laughs> wow. Yeah. This isn't, uh, uh, Lewis Perry talks about it in his book, Radical Abolitionism. I used to have a, a film, what do they call it, microfilm a fiche, a film, of a Spooner's correspondence. And uh, he actually talks about it. Garrett Smith was supposed to provide the money. Uh, fortunately, probably, the plan went nowhere. But these were, you know, we think of Lysander Spooner, oh, great, you know, no treason, you know, all that stuff. Uh, these were serious people. I mean, <laughs> yeah. um, well, I, I, I'm kind of glad that that plan wasn't attempted because it, it would have gone nowhere. And, you, but you that's one a, of those little interesting details of history. You have a Spooner selection in the book, um, which is one of my favorite Spooners, The Vices Are Not Crimes. Oh, yeah, that's a great, that's great. Um, 
which yeah, wonderful. Uh, that that was originally published at an, as you probably know, an anonymous chapter in a book by D.O. Lewis called Prohibition of Failure. I think was the name of it. Uh, and uh, the identity of their author wasn't known until ben, after Spooner died, and Benjamin uh, Tucker published an obituary of him in Liberty and mentioned that he had written this piece. You know, I, I did some research on who D.O. Lewis was and actually read through the entire book. He was an interesting character. He was an ardent uh, temperance movement guy. But in the early history of the temperance movements, both in England and in America, the temperance wasn't the same as prohibition. Temperance was voluntary. Herbert Spencer's uncle, uh, Reverend Thomas Spencer, was deeply involved in the temperance movement in England. When I first saw that, I thought, well, geez, please don't tell me that one of these crazy exceptions, you know, everybody should be free, you know, except to drink alcohol. But it wasn't like that at all. These temperance people, many of them were uh, uh, vehemently opposed to prohibition. So they had people come up and take temperance oaths. I suppose it was an early version of Alcoholics Anonymous, something like that. But anyway, it appeared in a book by this guy, D.O. Lewis, who had some... Uh, kind of nutty, I don't know if they were water cures or something, but uh, he was one of those interesting characters who was pushing temperance but not uh, prohibition. And I think that's probably the reason that Spooner agreed to write that chapter. And let me tell you one other thing about that, if you don't mind me speculating. One thing, one thing that makes that, that essay extremely interesting historically is Spencer, oh, I'm sorry, Spooner, as you know, came out of the abolitionist movement. Uh, he was a very important figure in that movement. Now, in that movement, you have the people like especially the Garrisonians, who were very religious, and they condemned slavery primarily because it was a sin, not because it violated rights. They believed it violated rights, but it was part of the movement to stamp out sin. Now, as a result of that, what happens after the Civil War, after uh, the slaves are freed, what happens to these people? A lot of them go into not just the temperance movement, the abolitionist movement, I mean, I'm sorry, the um, prohibition movement. They start to, to uh, call for, we got to, make alcohol illegal. See, they're very questionable libertarians from that point of view. But what Spooner, I think, recognized was, okay, my fellow anti-slavery crusaders made a big mistake because the problem with slavery is not that it's a sin. It's, it's a violation of rights. It's a crime. And I'm pretty sure he wrote that piece uh, in, with that in mind that so many of his fellow abolitionists did not distinguish between sins and crimes. And uh, there's a very curious thing. I used to spend practically live in the UCLA Research Library. I went through the minutes of the Liberty Party, which in the 1840s uh, was formed by the abolitionists. It was a single plank party, abolished slavery. That was it. Okay. At some convention, this was probably, I'm, I, this was decades ago, probably late 1840s, somebody said, you know, well, we've got to broaden our plank. This, this is just too narrow. You know, we've got to have more here. So they agreed on a second plank. And guess what the second plank is? Prohibition of spirits. Really? So not, yeah. <laughs> Talk about weird. I mean, that's one of those really disconnect. Well, what sense does that make? Well, the connecting link was the fact that these guys viewed slavery as a sin. And it was part of the crusade to stamp out sin. Now, I'm not saying there weren't some good libertarians in the abolitionist movement. There were, Spooner being another example. And there were a bunch of others. But I've just, that's one of those fascinating little glitches in intellectual history. I remember, I, I can almost remember the day, this must have been 35 years ago, I pulled out this thing, and it was the minutes of the, of the, uh, of the convention, the Liberty Party convention. And I, read, I sat down and read through it for about 40 minutes. And then I got to that part about that other plant, plank, and I just went, what? I did that kind of double take. If I'd been drinking water, I would have spit it out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's what, what makes these things interesting, is that, you know, how were these people thinking? Anyway, I'm sorry for the long speech on Spooner. I've always waited for a chance to tell my theory about vices are not crimes, and now I finally had that chance. Excellent. <laughs> of all the essays that you collected in this book, which one's your favorite? Oh, man, I have several. One of them, it'll sound weird because it's probably the most difficult to read, is the William Wollaston. It's an excerpt from a book, it's 1720s. A very little-known philosopher. I wrote an article on him. It was my first academic article uh, in the Journal of Libertarian Studies on him back in, oh, God, 76 or something, uh, Murray Rothbard's journal. And uh, he's fascinating. Um, he was very well-known in his day. He, the, his book was a bestseller. Uh, it's, it's virtually unknown today. Even history, historians of philosophy don't know much about it. But it excited a lot of in interest. But anyway, it's, it's, I forget the, what we call the excerpt. But it's this discussion of individuality being part of the human personality. It's a very interesting tradition in the libertarian tradition. It also pops up in the 19th century with Thomas Hodgkin. I sometimes characterize, 
characterize this as the extensionalist, extensional view of private property. The basic idea here is <clears throat> in, in the justification of property rights. It's not just the Lockean, although there's some of this in Locke when he talks about mixing one's labor with the land. Um, it's the idea that private property is an extension of the self. Because you can't live in the real world without property. And when you create something or when you trade for it or buy it, that thing becomes part of you, an extension of you in effect. Now, I'm obviously oversimplifying this, but that's the general idea. So it's not just like there's your stuff out there that people can take and it doesn't affect you. What these people tried to do was make part property, external property, part of the individual an essential part of the good life for the individual. That's very clear in the excerpt from Wollaston, and it's also uh, also very clear in the excerpt from Thomas Hodgkin. So those are two of my favorites. As we mentioned at the beginning of this episode, this reader, Individualism a Reader, is the first in a series from libertarianism.org. So what can our readers look for, our readers of this book and readers of the site, look for next? The next reader will be called Critics of State Education a Reader. Uh, this will have the most – almost all of this will be virtually unknown. Uh, I did an article many years ago on the so-called voluntaries in Britain and these were very principled uh, opponents of state education. I don't think there's a modern argument against state education that wasn't used by these English or British writers from roughly 1843 to about 1860. It's a fascinating movement, almost never mentioned. I discuss it somewhat in my Cambridge book, uh, uh, A System of Liberty. But it's almost never mentioned, and I wanted to go back because I spent I spent probably a year writing that article and Xeroxed off just mountains of pages because UCLA had a pretty good representation of that literature. It's very hard to find. A lot of it you can't even find on Google Books. I had to order stuff from England. Uh, I knew what to order because I was already familiar with the literature, but it involves names like uh, Edward Baines, Jr., who was the editor of the Leeds Mercury, the most influential provincial paper in England. Um, uh, um, Edward Mile, who was an editor of a paper called The Nonconformist, in which Her uh, Herbert Spencer wrote his first articles in his early 20s. Anyway, this, is, this isn't that kind of compromising, well, you know, we should have vouchers. And this was just, no, keep the state out of education altogether. And these people were also, they were, most of them were congregationalists. They were also very active in providing free schools for children. They were at the forefront of free education provided by charity. So it's a fascinating story. The book will include more from than just writings from those people. But the writings from those people are just virtually, un they've just forgotten. It's almost as if they've never been written. And believe me, they are wonderful. I mean, I'm calling things like compulsory education, characterizing it as child kidnapping, um, and Bain saying things like whenever, and, and they repudiated any government aid to schools. Uh, Baines once said that when the government offers help, it's like the help of a policeman with a handcuff, there's a handcuff at the end of it. That once you get into this system, you won't be able to get out. The state will grow more and more intrusive, more powerful. It will drive voluntary schools out of existence, and you'll end up pretty much with the bureaucrat nightmare bureaucratic system we have today. They were very clear about their predictions. It's, it's one of the best examples of social predictions, that if you let the government get its foot in the door, it's just going to expand and expand and expand. It's a wonderful collection. And like I said, uh, there are a few things in there, like maybe Spencer, that libertarians have read. But I would say a good 90 percent of that book, uh, even hardcore libertarians, will be totally new to them. So we're, uh, Marilyn and I are – and I want to give a shout out to Marilyn Moore, my co-editor, because she undertakes a lot of the grunt work on this stuff. And I probably would never get these out at all if it weren't for Marilyn. So thank you, Marilyn, for your help. Uh, but anyway, it, it's, it's a, I'm very excited personally about getting this out because it brings out this whole raft of literature that's just been virtually forgotten. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.